Hello, welcome to the Boston session of the Pear Symposium. I'm Martin Wattenberg. I'm a research scientist at Google and one of the co-founders of Pear, and I'm delighted to be here today. So this is a virtual symposium, so let's get oriented. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is, just to be clear, one of three sessions on live stream. There was a session in London that uh, happened earlier today. This one is happening now. Our theme is exploring objective functions as boundary objects. And I'll explain a little bit about what that means in a moment. And then there's another session happening, happening later today uh, on Seattle time. Uh, next slide. So for the Boston session, the agenda looks something like this. We're gonna, uh, I'm gonna welcome you. We're gonna do a little bit of housekeeping. We'll explain a little bit of uh, the theme of the session. There will then be a lightning talks uh, by our three fantastic panelists. Um, and I'm gonna, that you'll notice that there's an ish in this schedule. And that's because we, I think we may actually finish the lightning talks a little bit before 11 and that's good, great. That's gonna give us a little bit of extra time on our panel. Uh, the panel should wrap up at around 11.30. And then from 11.45 to 12.30 PM, for those of you who have been signed up, there are breakout sessions where you can discuss in small groups. Next slide, please. Uh, I want to mention that there are captions available and the link is listed in the YouTube live stream description. So you can find the link there. Next slide. Uh, so I also want to mention, and again, this is part of the virtual symposium experience. You know, we're living in a unique time in history. Uh, there's a pandemic. Uh, please take breaks. Don't push yourself if you experience, you know, video fatigue. Uh, obviously, it's fine to drop out. Uh, it almost doesn't need to be said, but I think it's good for us to recognize this. So with that, um, I would like to turn this over to Kristen Conrad in University Relations to say a few words. Thank you so much, Martin. As he mentioned, my name is Kristen Conrad. I'm a program manager on the Google University Relations team. I just wanted to take a brief moment to um, familiarize you with the University Relations um, team. So I partnered with a pair of leads to put on this symposium. And I just want to tell you a little bit more about university relations. What we do, we help enable academic collaborations for Google research, manage and support the interface between academic research and research across Google, promote and support academic research in Google's areas of interest, and support the next generation of researchers. We do this for the general good and participating in the ecosystem of academic industry and government to create research results and impact that would not otherwise be possible and to make the world a better place. This symposium and the research you all do is a great example of this. Some of the results of, of this are papers, open source code, data sets, supports for all researchers across Google. And if you would mind going to the next slide, we have a couple different programs across university relations that offer bi-directional flow. Everything from external research funding, to scientific ex exchange, that includes research workshops such as this one, and building the next generation of researchers. All of these lead to the great outcomes previously mentioned. If you wouldn't mind going to the next slide. And just to tell a little bit more about some of our programs, the Research Scholar Program aims to support early career faculty who are pursuing research in fields relevant to Google. Faculty must have their PhD for within seven years of submission and applications are currently open for that program. We also have the Award for Inclusion Research. It's a global program which recognizes and supports the academic research in computing or technology that, rep, um, that addresses the needs of underrepresented groups. The, our Visiting Researcher Program um, allows various ways for Googlers to do research with faculty, postdocs, and industry researchers. The Explore CSR program collaborates with the university to motivate women to pursue graduate study and research within CS. If any of these would be a match for your needs, I encourage you to reach out to one of our Google researchers or myself. I have my information on the next slide. And we also, you can feel free to email me or more information is available on the symposium website. Martin, back to you. Great, okay, uh, next slide please. Um, all right, I want to uh, talk a little bit about the People Plus AI research team and what we do. Um, so 
you know, are we, we look at what we do essentially human centered research and design, and we're trying to make people plus AI partnerships productive, enjoyable, and fair. Next slide. Uh, so the thing I would emphasize is it's a broad team in, in many respects. Um, we're uh, divided among many different continents, um, based many locations, and it includes a set of people who are, are highly multidisciplinary. We have uh, engineers, we've got research scientists, we've got people from the user experience perspective, uh, product managers, all sorts of types of people, and that's very much by design. We feel like uh, this is essential to exploring the space. Next slide, please. Um, so to describe a little bit more about what we do, we think about this in uh, sort of three respects. So one thing, um, next slide, is that we conduct and we publish um, human AI interaction research. And you know, we do this through papers. Um, you know, please go to our website. We've got a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of good stuff there that you can find. Uh, next slide. Uh, we also create and launch open source um, tools and platforms. And the goal here is that you know, we build a lot of systems, we try them out in Internally, but we don't just use them internally at Google. Uh, we try to make things public whenever we can. And we think that this is an important way to get ideas out there um, and get tools out there for people to use. And then finally, next slide, um, one of our big goals is to widen the circle of who can actually participate in the development of AI. Um, that's, that's sort of a key thing for us to do. And we're going to talk a little bit more about how we do that now. Um, so uh, let's, next slide, please. Um, in fact, that leads us to the theme of this session, which is boundary objects for participatory machine learning. Um, that's basically the theme of this, this whole uh, symposium. And I want to talk about what that means. Um, so first of all, next slide, uh, let's talk about participatory machine learning. The idea here is that ML is, is such an important technology and it affects so many people that it's critical that we have a wide set of people who can help um, in the development, the deployment, the monitoring it, thinking about it, and so forth. And you know, we're certainly not the only people with this goal. I think it's a, a generally shared goal by many people. Um, but it's it's hard. And one of the reasons it's hard is that it intrinsically means you need to have collaborations across people with different types of expertise and different levels of expertise. Now, luckily, we don't have to just start from scratch in thinking about how to make these collaborations happen. Um, for one thing, sociologists have been on the case for a long time at, at looking at how these multidisciplinary collaborations work. And one of the key things, next slide, please, is um, something called a boundary object. Um, so the idea is a boundary object is essentially a bridge between disciplines. It's an object that sits between different communities. It's something concrete, you know, a specimen or a field note as, as described in this definition here, that's used in different ways by different communities and is a way for them to collaborate. Next slide. So in this session, um, you know, there are many types of boundary objects. And in fact, we heard in the previous session in London uh, about data, for example, as a boundary object. What I'd like to talk about in this section, and what I'm, our speakers will, will discuss, is objective functions as boundary objects. And I think this is a, a critical concept. So next slide, please. Let's talk about what we mean by an objective function. So machine learning essentially is done via a mathematical process of optimization. Um, someone somewhere writes down a mathematical function um, and the system essentially tries to optimize this function. Um, it's funny, one of the ways you can tell that this is a, an important concept is it has so many names. Um, you know, people talk about objective functions and the optimization literature, but you also hear people in different communities talk about loss functions, reward functions, fitness functions, and so forth. It's kind of a pick your metaphor situation. Um, and it's not so much people in different communities are, are motivated by fear or greed or whatever, but there actually are nuances to these different ideas. But the point really is that we have a mathematical function that the system is trying to optimize. So let's talk about um, how these things can operate as, as boundary objects in practice. So next slide, please. So the good part is that this means that a machine learning system has an explicit, precise definition. It's written down of its actual goal. 
this is very unlike traditional software. Um, where if anyone who's ever encountered a pile of legacy code often knows like one of the big questions is, what is it even trying to do? In a sense with the machine learning system, you actually do have in some respects a fairly concise description of what it's trying to do. That's the good. Okay, next slide, please. Um, however, there's also the bad. Um, the bad is that as concise as this definition is, as explicit as it is, it can be pretty messy in practice because often the definition of the function, in fact, usually it relies on a data, a training data set. And so understanding the function means understanding a big data set at the very least. Um, another problem is that the math of what's written down may not align with what a human designer actually wanted. You know, it's always an approximation, a kind of proxy. Um, and worse yet, because of the form in which it's written down, typically in code or you know, maybe somewhere else as mathematical notation, it's not always intelligible to non-engineers. I mean, even engineers may have trouble too, but it's, it's, there's something about the language that makes it actually hard to understand. So that's the good and the bad. Next slide, please. Um, but I do think there's something beautiful here, which is that this is kind of an under-recognized site for collaboration. And I think if we acknowledge the importance of objective functions as boundary objects, I think there really is a chance where we can start to understand the pitfalls. Um, we can start to see opportunities for people collaborating and so forth. Okay, next slide. So, you know, this leads to the question of what design looks like in a world where people are thinking about these objective functions. Um, on the left, there's kind of the cliche traditionalist view of design as, you know, maybe choosing color palettes. Obviously, the world is much more complicated than that in reality. That's a caricature. On the right, there's a mathematical function that we could ask, well, are we asking designers to think about math? Next slide. Um, the answer is maybe, um, but we definitely do not want uh, design of these systems to be restricted for people who um, love equations, not at all. And this is exactly why this ultimately becomes um, sort of a problem of collaboration, participation, and really thinking about what is the right way to uh, think about these functions in a way that uh, multiple people with different levels of expertise and types of expertise can grapple with them and help design systems. So with that, I would like to introduce our speakers. We have three people today who are uh, fantastically well qualified to talk about this. Um, and I'm going to introduce them in order. Ed Chi uh, is going to give our first talk. Um, he's a principal scientist at Google Research. Uh, Margaret Mitchell, uh, she's also in Google Research. She uh, uh, lead, co leads an ethical AI team. Um, and uh, Sendil Malanathan uh, is, uh, let's see, the Roman Family University Professor of Computation and Behavioral Sciences at the University of Chicago. Um, and has you know, he's done extremely interesting work um, in, in many areas. So with that, I don't want to take any more time away from the speakers. Um, so I'm going to uh, you know, uh, uh, let, let them start to speak. Um, but the one thing I want to say is that you can share your questions as we go. As you hear their, um, their talks, if interesting things occur to you, you can email this address, parasymposium2020 at google.com, and add your questions to um, the Dory or the question and answer system that we use. Uh, I don't promise we'll get to every question um, in the panel, but hopefully we'll get to a few. Um, and with that, I'd like to go over to our speakers. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you to Martin for inviting me to give this lightning talk. Um, I wanted to talk to you about my perspectives on the essentially a twist on this loss function as a boundary object idea. My name is Ed, and I'm from the Brain uh, SIR team. Uh, uh, here at Google. Um, so why am I qualified to talk about this? Well, first of all, um, I was an HCI researcher uh, with some connections into the CSCW uh, community. And in, par in particular, I did a lot of work in social computing. But since arriving at Google, uh, my team actually have been working quite a bit on recommender system, notification systems, and classification systems, and have made more than 300 improvements across many different product surfaces uh, uh, here at Google. And um, in particular, my team has focused uh, across these four different pillars, uh, neural modeling, reinforcement learning, uh, responsible ML and fairness, and as well as robustness techniques uh, for ML systems. 
And these four pillars interact in very strategic and important ways. I don't have the time uh, to actually discuss them in detail, but I'd be happy to uh, answer questions or discuss with you uh, uh, during the panel. Now, with that uh, aside, um, I wanted to make three points around uh, this idea of boundary objects. And the first one is this idea of objectives versus loss functions. Now, product and user objectives are indeed often translated into loss functions. And so the premise of the discussion that we have today uh, certainly makes a lot of sense to me and is not lost on me. However, um, there are some complexities here, and of which I want to bring up two. The first one that many of you may already know about um, is something called uh, the Goodhart's Law. And this is one little pesky problem is that um, oftentimes what we have found inside of Google is that whenever you propose a measure uh, to be a target, um, indeed, it turns out that it often ceases to be a good measure. So uh, here's a nice little illustration of this. Uh, if you measure people on the number of nails made, then what you might end up getting is thousands of teeny, teeny little nails that are not very useful to you. On the other hand, uh, if you measure people based upon the weight of the nails that, that, that they're making, then you might end up getting a few giant, very heavy nails because that's the fastest way to create uh, uh, weighty nails. Uh, and then uh, what happens is that those nails are probably not very useful to you to, as well. So uh, this concept of Goodhart's Law uh, has been well known in the sociological and economic circles. And sometimes it's also uh, referred to as Campbell's Law. Um, and there are subtle differences between the two. But the point is that um, um, uh, metrics are pesky and they're difficult uh, to work with uh, for these reasons. The other point I wanted to make uh, about uh, loss functions as uh, boundary objects is that oftentimes loss functions are actually situated within a wicked problem. Now, in, in case you're not familiar with this concept, uh, the concept of a wicked problem is that it is a problem that is difficult or impossible to solve because of incompleteness or contradictory or changing requirements that are very dynamic and very difficult to recognize. Uh, it often refers to ideas or problems that cannot be fixed, uh, perhaps, for example, in time or uh, where there's no single solution to these problems. And the wickedness here, by the way, um, doesn't refer to the fact that the problem is evil. It just refers to that the problem um, has a resistance to eventual resolution. So in fact, another definition of the problem is that the social complexity is so high around the problem that there's no deterministic uh, stopping point. And because of these complex interdependencies, uh, efforts to solve it uh, becomes uh, uh, very problematic because it just continues to reveal other problems kind of like peeling back an onion. So I want to illustrate this by examples that I know about. So for example, when you're building recommender systems, uh, in the past, before say uh, five, six years ago, a common technique would be just to simply uh, uh, optimize for a single objective. But when in fact, nowadays it's become much more and more common uh, to actually solve for multiple and diverse set of objectives using newer architectures that look like this. So this is an, uh, an actual uh, architectural diagram that we uh, uh, presented as a, uh, a recommender uh, neural architecture uh, in a Rexis paper. Now, these neural architectures are actually really interesting. Um, you know, despite the fact that maybe perhaps some of you have not had any experience uh, doing neural modeling, but even that diagram uh, can kind of give you a sense of what's going on uh, in the system in that there are multiple objectives that you're trying to optimize at the same time. And this is, brings me to uh, the second point I wanted to make uh, about these, these neural architectures as boundary objects. Uh, these boundary objects are defined to be uh, things that cross this community of practice. So that means that business owners, um, engineers, uh, executives, uh, as well as perhaps uh, uh, external researchers can look at these uh, um, uh, objects, these architectural diagrams, for example, or definitions of loss functions, and be able to understand them, to make sense of them, uh, and the fact that they are plastic, meaning that you can actually make changes to them, uh, that gives you uh, that that uh, that communicates the the, the kind of uh, improvements that you would like to make, make them uh, objects that actually have uh, um, a kind of design uh, ability to it uh, that uh, enables communication. Right. So uh, Charlotte Lee has talked quite a bit about these kinds of boundary objects as negotiation artifacts in collaboration, and indeed these neural architecture diagrams and the neural architecture ideas um, essentially become those negotiation artifacts uh, in our collaboration with business owners, users, and, and, and uh, other key stakeholders. So I think this idea that boundary objects can be uh, a communication uh, vehicles for different community practice indeed does play out. Um, and importantly, the, the idea that these boundary objects does cross different community of practice, that product managers 
business owners um, and engineers and researchers can all use them uh, to communicate with each other is a very important concept that, that actually does work out uh, in, in this setting. Now, what I showed you earlier uh, is essentially an idea map, right? So a, a, a map that gives you an idea of how you might be able to change these uh, architectures to further your goals, right? So maybe you can add additional tasks or you can ask additional uh, uh, experts or that you should be changing uh, inputs uh, in, instead of just thinking about the, the neural architecture. Now, it turns out that, of course, these neural architectures can be drawn at different scales, um, at different granularities, and so we can create different details for different actors or different communities of, of, of practitioners uh, in the space. Uh, we can also make them extremely more uh, uh, um, detailed so that uh, engineers have specifications to get real understandings of how uh, components interact with each other. So for example, here uh, is a more detailed diagram that we presented uh, that shows how a um, mixture of expert and an idea for a neural architecture can resolve task conflicts between uh, multiple objectives or um, to create these shallow towers to factorize uh, bias and variance uh, problems uh, in, the, in, in the system. The third point I wanted to make is that neural architectures are uh, combined with objective and loss functions are actually learning objects. Now, why am I mentioning that? Well, one of the things that I learned when I looked up the Wikipedia article on uh, boundary objects is that um, there's this article by uh, Anne Balsano and, 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 and uh, one of her collaborators, I know Anne, so I'm referring to her, um, talking about uh, that there are these boundary objects that are actually learning objects. In particular, she was talking about this in terms of uh, a distributed collaborative course uh, and how objects within that course um, turn into essentially pedagogical materials that can be easily annotated and modified and passed around. And more importantly, that these material uh, materials can evolve to archive the meaning of their use in particular situations. So in the context of a classroom, they will have a particular uh, meaningfulness, but uh, when you take them home and use them as part of your homework, uh, they take on a different uh, um, uh, situation and a different meaningfulness. So I think of loss function and neural architecture uh, diagrams in particular, uh, having some of these very similar capabilities. They do serve as pedagogical material to communicate uh, with each, uh, for engineers to communicate with each other and to uh, uh, business owners and product managers. Um, and they are indeed easily annotated and modified, uh, and they do evolve over time. Uh, and so uh, from that perspective, uh, it fits these definitions. So those are the three points I wanted to make uh, that um, business objectives or user objectives indeed can be translated into loss functions, but they're not singular and that you need uh, multiple objectives. Uh, and loss function is not enough, that you need neural architectures combined together with loss functions. In fact, it's loss functions is part of it. That together seems to form a kind of boundary object. And then finally, um, uh, they're, it, it's, they're beyond uh, boundary objects. They really combine together to form a kind of learning object. So perhaps um, I can summarize my entire point uh, by a single thesis, which is that product objectives in systems like recommenders and notification systems and classification systems are not just summarized into these single you know, loss functions. Um, as an example, recommenders are actually dynamic wicked problems that are socially complex. And it's very, very difficult for us to say that, okay, we're done with designing these recommenders because often they're just uh, evolving social uh, uh, environment in which these recommenders live in. What this all implies is that what we need are learning objects, uh, such as these uh, neural architecture diagrams, uh, that allow us and help us to archive and make sense of the evolving complex problem. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Margaret Mitchell. I'm a researcher at Google, um, and I'll be talking about some things I've learned uh, developing machine learning models um, throughout my career. So we often like to conceptualize and think of a machine learning pipeline as containing four basic uh, steps where training data are collected, a model is trained, media um, can then be put through some post-processing step, and then people will see the output. Um, but before we even begin the process, the data itself encodes a subset of human perspectives, right? So when people choose to talk about things, um, that is their skew towards what to talk about. Um, 
data is not a snapshot of everything and all experiences for all of humanity. It's a very limited subset uh, with all kinds of skews reflecting the way uh, people represent themselves in that data. Uh, so the bias has a ripple effect throughout the rest of model development as the data for training itself is by definition the only information that a model can learn from. Um, and that's not even addressing the human decisions in what data to collect and how it is annotated, which further injects uh, human decisions and human skews. More kinds of biases are then injected into model development by the choice of model, the choice of objective function, uh, how the model is evaluated, um, and the choices therefore like persist in the rest of the model life cycle. Human biases are further injected into any post-processing decisions or a lack of post-processing. Uh, and finally, once a model is deployed, uh, people see the output and begin to act on that output. But as people act on the output, they are themselves creating more data based on that limited subset of data that is now made available from the model. So this then creates uh, an echo chamber or feedback loop where the model then learns uh, on the human data that has already encoded the biases in the first model decisions. So this can amplify problematic decisions over time. Um, and I like to call this bias laundering. So one of the main ideas of this talk um, and in model development generally um, to keep in mind is that data set, the choice of data set defines what we care about for the model. The default approach to handling representation and data is to simply use the training data that's available in a specific data set, uh, evaluate on the evaluation data that's available, often with very similar distributions to the training data set. Um, and this carries with it the value judgment that the representation of individuals in the data set is the representation that should be there for the goals of the model. So if critical aspects of the problem space are not represented in the data, then using the data out of the box means you are making the value judgment that these aspects should not be represented. Uh, for example, if a population is over or underrepresented in the data and that leads to the selection of a model that performs worse um, on a possibly different subpopulation, then the implicit value judgment is that the model should perform worse on that subpopulation. If the data and training creates models that disproportionately under, underperform on some populations, uh, then you're making the value judgment that some populations should receive worse performance. So one of the most important and simplest things we can do in this space is to think about the benefits and risks for different model errors and contexts. So, uh, for example, in classification systems, we can think about the error space following this basic breakdown of a confusion matrix where things either exist or they don't, a model predicts they exist or they don't, um, it can get these things right or it can get these things wrong. Uh, so something exists and it's not predicted is a false negative, something doesn't exist uh, and is predicted is a false positive, uh, and these metrics are uh, not all created equal, right? So um, in some cases, a false negative can be much more problematic given the foreseeable use of the model in contexts. So for example, privacy in images, a false negative can lead to uh, something not being blurred, which could lead to something like identity theft. False negatives might be better than false positives in something like spam filtering, uh, where if you get a job offer or uh, a letter from a loved one, um, and this is filtered out as spam, uh, you can miss something really important. Um, but note here that the usage and context really matters. So if foreseeable users include those that are easily scammed, leading to a loss of wealth, uh, then false negatives have greater risk and model development needs to balance the different populations in determining the optimal models. Um, so one of the themes here uh, when we think about the ethical development of models, one of the most critical components is foresight. Who are the intended users and who are the foreseeable users? What are the model goals and what are the foreseeable harms from different model errors, right? Whatever you do results in an, in an output, right? Um, 
So I'm just an engineer doesn't quite fly. It doesn't actually mean anything other than that you're intentionally being ignorant about these different kinds of errors that you are creating in model development. Um, so I wanna bring in a case study. Um, I was able to work on a coronavirus forecasting model um, and there were all sorts of decisions we had to make there. So first off, what to predict, cases, deaths, et cetera, um, how to measure the quality of imperfect predictions, uh, using things like what time span should we be using in a forecast, uh, A to forecast and B to uh, measure errors, um, how to group populations in the predictions, uh, such as county level, uh, state level, things like that, um, and also whether or not to model the effect of interventions uh, or the effect of the forecast itself on changing uh, the behavior of the virus. So common metrics in forecasting uh, and in machine learning more broadly include things like mean absolute error, mean squared error, uh, and then variations thereof. Uh, but notice here that these are all absolute values, right? So under prediction and over prediction aren't distinguished as part of model training. Um, so this is, uh, uh, th these are metrics that correspond to things like L1 loss or L2 loss. But what this misses is that drastically different effects of over predicting cases and under predicting cases are at play. So if there are false positives for case counts and the prediction is that there will be more, more cases than there are, then the organizations and people using the forecast will be over prepared. But a false negative uh, in under predicting case counts can create situations where there are less resources than necessary and ultimately something like more death, right? So although both errors have pros and cons, false negatives are a foreseeable worse harm than false positives. Um, so one of the punchlines here is that the I'm just an engineer approach inflicts foreseeable harm. This intentional ignorance is your value laden choice. The goal in ethical uh, model development is to make explicit the value laden and normative decisions encoded uh, in development with respect to the system usage in context. Um, Development uh, considerations include the choices of data, the model, the objective, how to evaluate. Um, and usage, the considerations include the outcomes that the model may contribute to, including misuse and malicious use, um, with all kinds of different considerations, such as foreseeable harms, foreseeable discriminatory uses, um, and all the other uh, reasonable uh, side effects or direct effects of different model decisions. Okay, thank you. Okay, let me start. Um, what I want to talk today is about um, algorithms and how we interpret them, machine learning algorithm in particular, and I'm going to tell two stories. And these two stories together, I think, will give us some guidance, um, hopefully, about this problem. The first story is not really uh, work I've done. The first story is uh, work that a Google team did uh, a few years ago. So this was early, early days uh, before there was a lot of work on um, machine learning algorithms applied to medicine. So there they said we have a huge data set with x-rays and in the x-rays we have labels on whether there's a problem. So they said let's build a pathology detector. And so that was their goal with the project. And what they found, this is pretty early, they found remarkable success in this activity. And it was almost too good to be true. But they were like, well, this is really interesting, so let's go and have a look and see what the algorithm is seeing, the x-ray. So they applied attribution techniques of the kind that you're all probably familiar with, um, where, which were, where we can see which pixels were most influential. So in doing this, they um, saw, okay, well, look, on this x-ray, this is where the algorithm is really noticing signal or picking up on signal. So why here? So let's kind of zoom in and adjust the contrast and say, wait, that's a little weird. That doesn't look like it's part of the lung. What is that? Well, it turns out that turns out to be pen marks by the doctor. So what they thought was a pathology detector was actually a pen mark detector. Radiologists in the system from which the data came, when they looked at the x-ray and they saw something, they'd put a little pen mark on it. And so as a result, the algorithm learned to find pen marks. But of course, this is a disaster. You can't deploy an algorithm that was a pen mark detector 
to say, now we have a pathology detector. This is the kind of problem we all worry about when training machine learning algorithms, that instead of picking up the signal we want, it's picked up some other thing that's an artifact of the data set that's a confounder. This is why we have interpretability techniques at some basic level. In fact, I wanna say this story is just a nice encapsulation for me of how we tend to normally and most often use interpretability, which is quite similar to how in another aspect of computer science, what we tend to do, which is when we program, we tend to debug code. Similarly here, interpretability is being used to debug the machine learning pipeline, like problems in the data, things that aren't what we want. And since these algorithms are black boxes, we can't know what they're doing. So we use interpretability to try and get a handle on that to make sure they're doing what we want them to do, much like with traditional code. Okay, that's story one. Story two also involves x-rays. Um, but this time it's about osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis, for those of you who don't know, is a very painful degenerative condition. Um, uh, and in this case, we're gonna focus on the knee. It's, it happens in many joints, but um, knee osteoarthritis is sort of the, the space between the bones, the, the, their sort of lost cartilage and the meniscus is worn down. And so you really, it's painful whenever you walk or, or move. So um, it's not a pleasant condition. Um, and many people have this chronic condition. And the big consequence here is pain. Now, the story I wanna tell about the pain is that it turns out that, well, here's how we measure it. We ask people suffering from osteoarthritis, tell us on the scale how much pain you have, and there's an official pain scale, Coos Pain Score. What researchers have found when looking at the pain experienced by those uh, having osteoarthritis is that actually we uh, find that the disadvantage in the United States um, African Americans, low income, a lower education, experience much more pain, which is kind of tragic. They're sort of not just disadvantaged socioeconomically, but also physiologically, they're experiencing more pain by quite a bit. It's about two thirds of a standard deviation uh, by race. So why is this? Well, there are two theories, broadly speaking, of course, there are many theories, as with all things. One theory says it's inside their knees. That's because because of their lives, the, the disadvantaged have more physical ailments. So when they all have, sure, they all, everyone had, you know, who in the sample had osteoarthritis, but those who are disadvantaged had a more severe case of it. The other is that it's outside their knees, which is sort of non-knee related factors that might be driving this, you know, life stress, et cetera. And this is also very tragic. It's that the conditions of poverty or disadvantage exaggerate physical pain, of course, a very related view is it's not inside their knees. It's just, you know, the survey measure is biased. But to me, there's two categories. Is there something in their knees versus is it something else is pretty big. So how do we get at this? Well, the way we, of course, we would get at this is that we would, we of course have one read of the problem, the pain score. Well, let's get, now we get the x-rays, let's get a clinician to look at the read, get a KL grade. That's the grade of uh, osteoarthritis severity. And now ask, conditional on the KL grade, the severity of the osteoarthritis in the knee, is there still a pain gap? And what we tend to find is that in fact, even after you control for the um, severity that's on the x-axis here, you see that uh, the gap barely changes. So by this data, people have said, wow, it's not a physiological problem, but something else, uh, a psychological, sort of socioeconomic, uh, or perhaps a measurement artifact. But is this really true? What did we actually do? We had a, we had a person look at the x-ray. I don't know, maybe there's stuff in the knee that the clinician didn't know to look for. I mean, medical knowledge is a limited thing that's still in flux. It's why we're still doing science. So let's instead have an algorithm look at the x-ray and predict pain directly. Now you'll notice, if there was something in the knee, the algorithm given only the knee x-ray ought to find it. If there's nothing in the knee, and it is psychological, given just the x-ray, it ought not to find it. So rather than conditioning on the KL grade, let's condition on this algorithmically generated thing. Let's, in fact, rather than relying on what doctors know to look for, let's, let's ask an algorithm to look and see, is there some physiological correlate that you see in the knee uh, about this? So 
Ironically, what we're using here is we're actually saying, let's use a machine learning algorithm to listen to what the patients are telling us, my knee hurts, and try to isolate if there's something in the x-ray. So the input is image of both knees and the output that the algorithm is trained on, the label is the Coos pain score in the knee. It's important here, only the knee is given. That is, we'll come back later, but it's not like the algorithm is able to reconstruct. We certainly aren't giving it any of the other variables. And uh, such as race, education, we're only giving it the x-ray. And we'll deal with the possibility that the algorithm has somehow reconstructed these other variables. Okay, but the key is it only sees x-rays, doesn't have access to anything else. What we find here is that when we condition not on the doctor's score, but on the algorithmic prediction, that's on the right-hand side, the gap significantly diminishes. So while doctors don't see anything in the knee, algorithms definitely do. It's in their knees, which is what people have been telling us all along. And you can look at our paper, but we deal with all the obvious things. Is it image artifacts? Is the algorithm just predicting race somehow? A bunch of these things. What I want to do is to, to connect these two different stories back together. Both were about x-rays. Both are going to involve interpretability because now you're going to ask me, wait, what is the algorithm seeing? But what the algorithm is seeing in this second story is a different thing than in the first story. Let me tell you why. There are two different approaches. In the first story, we were having the algorithm predict the physician judgment. In the second story, we're having the algorithm predict the pain score. And in that difference, in that choice of label, is the entire story. When we predict KL grade, we're trying to automate human behavior. When we predict pain score, we're looking for things that we don't know about. When we're automating, interpretability is about debugging. We know what we want, just do it. When we're doing prediction, as this story just ended, we're like, wait, you found something I didn't know? Well, what did you find? Interpretability for discovery is a fundamentally different problem. So when we took our technique, the unknown interpretability techniques to apply it to this, it didn't produce much. Why? Because we don't exactly know what we're looking for. It's not a bug that we're looking for. As a result, interpretability for discovery is what I think I hope to encourage all of you to, is an interesting area to work on. It's much closer to visualization. It's kind of look at the data to learn. It involves feedback loops. I don't know. What is the algorithm saying? You're okay with low recall. Anything in the knee the algorithm saw, any new, use, any new signal is useful. And this activity of interpretability, I think, has not had the kind of tools associated with it. Most of the tools that we tend to have are are implicitly, though not explicitly, focused on finding flaws in the algorithms we have. So I hope to leave with these two stories as a call to action that this is a really interesting kind of interpretability to work on. Terrific. Um, I was delighted to see all of those talks. Um, I think they set up our panel, I think, perfectly in the sense that, you know, I, you, what you saw from Ed was, uh, sort of really nice um, explanation of a uh, fair amount of background, um, as well as some really interesting thoughts about things besides objective functions, but in the same orbit that can potentially be um, boundary objects we should think of as well. Um, in Margaret's talk, I think we saw sort of like the pitfalls of not collaborating. And in fact, the importance of being very, very thoughtful about the fact that we should collaborate, um, as well as I think the the really very important and concrete question of like, you know, when you think about objective functions, it's not necessarily something that involves incredibly fancy math and a million, you know, bells and whistles, but even the question of like how you weight false positives versus false negatives is is absolutely critical to the user experience um, and consequences of a system. And I think that's a really important example to keep in mind. Um, and then I think Sendil's uh, sort of two stories were sort of a beautiful example of um, kind of a cautionary tale of why, you know, an objective function may not be what you think it is. Um, and, you know, the fact that the data is, is hides a lot of important detail, um, but also where we can go with this and how we can think about this in a way that is actually, I think, highly sort of productive and, you know, humane in, in many respects. Um, so with that, one thing that um, I will say is that uh, we're actually ahead of schedule a little bit here.
Um, I said that we would begin at 11-ish, but um, maybe this is a fact about virtual conferences. Sometimes they can actually go um, really fast because people are not walking around the room to get up on stage. And so with that, I think we're ready to um, start our panel. We have all, all panelists here. Um, and again, I, you know, I'm going to introduce them. We've got uh, Sendil Malanathan uh, from the University of Chicago. Ed Chi uh, from Google, Google Research, uh, um, working on recommendation systems and many other things, and uh, Margaret Mitchell on the ethical AI team. So um, with that, um, I would like to start and you know, say one theme that I think ran across all of your talks, and which I think is very important here, is that you've all been in situations where there are people in very different roles working together on machine learning systems. Um, based on your experience, do you have any thoughts on the right way for people to communicate around objective functions? You don't necessarily, for example, want a user experience designer to have to know the esoterica around L1 versus L2 right, you know, regularization. Um, at the same time, there might be some things that are good for people on both sides, um, technical or you know, however you, you frame it to know. And I'd love to get your sense of from your experience or things you've seen, what are important ways that we can communicate across boundaries? If I may start, um, I think one of the things that I, I often think about these kinds of systems from the perspective of something called it we I. So it, the meaning the pronouns, right? And it refers to procedures and we meaning the social and I meaning what's my role uh, in the context. And uh, my experience in working on ML systems is that most of the time people actually understand very little about their role in the entire system. So for example, um, a product designer or a product manager might have some thoughts about how the product should function. Um, but uh, it actually has a real hard time communicating those ideas to either executive sponsors or to uh, mm -hmm. engineers who might implement them and might even have difficulty in discussing whether those ideas are even plausible or workable or can be implemented or whether the data even exists. Um, and engineers often also have ideas, uh, whether they're value latent or they're not uh, 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 value sensitive, as Meg was uh, mentioning or not, um, even if they were value sensitive uh, in thinking about their design, may, they may also not necessarily know about their commutation role within the system. Uh, is it really a responsibility to actually speak up, to actually expose their ideas? And if they do, what are the consequences of that? And so um, uh, sometimes it's just simply that the procedure for for communication is not well known uh, or, or not followed. And other times is actually just the social connections are very weak uh, within the team. Uh, and so it turns out uh, uh, very important issues in DEI like psych safety, et cetera, are also very important therefore for those roles to become uh, visible and, and, and actually uh, productive. And so the team performance becomes therefore uh, extremely important for realizing uh, uh, a good outcome, uh, good in quotes. Let me use the air quotes. <laughs> um, I, guess, I guess I can speak to this as well. Um, so uh, one thing that I've, that I've found that I think is relevant here is that everyone has a, a different role to play um, and uh, there's often people who are very good at translating across different disciplines and making, you know, boiling things down from something that's very mathematical to something that is just relatively intuitive. Um, that's not everyone, right? And not everyone should be required to do that, but we all have different strengths. And just as some people prefer to, you know, always say covariate, sometimes you need to say it's a variable. Um, in order to kind of like make these, you know, simplifying things, but but make them understood across, even if one person really has this view of how to think about it, one one person has this view of how to think about it. Um, but as long as you can kind of appreciate that there 
there are people who can play these roles of translation across that oftentimes people who are naive about it ask the hardest questions. Uh, some of the most like, oh no, moments in my life have been like telling people what I do at a party and then they like ask some question and I'm like, how did I never even think of that? Um, so it's just really important to recognize like all these different strengths that people are, are bringing to the table and just really support that everyone knows what they're talking about uh, within their realm of expertise and really leverage that. Let me add one thing you, you were asking Martin also about like sort of techniques that might work. One of the techniques, um, maybe, maybe we haven't tried this yet, but we're starting to figure out how to try it. So maybe I'm inviting guinea pigs. One of the techniques that we've been focusing a little bit on is that it, it, the mental model I think people have is one of trying to get to a consensus description. And in a way, I think that mental model is, is obviously right. We need consensus, but I think it doesn't pro properly identify where the flaw is or where the weakness is. I think the weakness is not a lack of consensus. I think the weakness is better put as we have different languages describing the same object. And in those languages, we have a description. We may, in translating back to some common language, imagine we have consensus, but in our own private languages, we're actually saying very different things. So if you imagine there's a, let's call it domain description of the objective function, there is a data description of the objective function. It's got to get instantiated in very specific variables and SQL queries. And then there is a sort of mathematical definition of the objective function. So we've got these three different objects that are actually just in three different languages. And you don't know when we converge on English, whether we actually are getting the translation back. So one of the things that I think could be interesting, and I suspect you all have better ways of doing this, but you know, there's, there's these games you play at parties where someone writes something on a piece of paper, someone then draws it, then someone else writes what they see in the drawing, then someone else then like, that's a game of like lost in translation. And I think something similar could be done here, which is, okay, you take my objective function, put it in a data set. Someone else who didn't hear what I thought the objective function was looks at the data instantiation and writes down what they think the, the objective function is. Someone then takes that, does the mathematical. I, I think it's finding those translational errors that I think could be uh, the most useful thing. That's yeah, I, I really like that idea. And I like the idea of putting it into sort of a game like form. Um, I think that that is fantastic, actually. Um, I'm curious, uh, if one, you know, big question is we've been talking so far about sort of designers of systems, um, people who are experts. Um, do you have any thoughts on how users people who like, let's just assume we don't want to require a lot of expertise or a lot of time, how, how we might get input from users, um, or even people are not using our system, but perhaps otherwise affected by it, uh, on, uh, on, on the idea behind what our objective functions should be or any comments on it. I mean, this is where things like participatory design come in. Ideally, you bring in uh, not only your target users, but people who will be affected by your system and you walk them through the various things you do and you ask them questions about it, uh, what they fear, uh, what they hope for. Um, again, this is a very translational exercise. You need to have people who are good about, you know, taking the very fundamental sort of mathematical ideas and, and translating them to sort of um, you know, general, um, general sort of colloquial uh, communication. Um, but yeah, one of the answers there is bring the people in, all the different people who you think might be affected. Uh, this often means trying to go um, and, and gather people around the world uh, who can weigh in. Um, and, you know, at a company like Google, maybe that's probably easier to do than at a university. Um, but this is sort of the ideal, right? You, it's the participatory approach where you bring in all the different uh, foreseeable uh, affected people and, and talk to them about what they're looking for. Maybe I can go next and, and, and quickly um, jump in here with a, with a small story. Uh, in, in roughly, I think, 1991 or so, when I was a... Uh, just starting out as a graduate student, um, I was studying with a, a recommender systems uh, professor. At the time, he didn't know that what that he was building was a recommender uh, systems 
uh, uh, John Riedel, uh, my, my late PhD advisor. And he proposed to me these ideas about using Pearson correlations to uh, uh, gather a bunch of users' votes and ratings, mm -hmm. and then use it to filter what was then known as Usenet news. And he proposes, hey, maybe you want to work on this for your PhD. And I said, John, that's a stupid idea. Um, you know, how are you going to get a bunch of people to rate a bunch of Usenet news sufficiently to tell you about their preferences? Um, such that you can actually run your algorithm. I, I just, you know, from an HCI perspective, I never believed that he would get enough data. Um, later on, my um, complaint actually uh, transitioned to something a little bit more nuanced. And this is maybe worth uh, pondering as well, uh, which is the, the continuation of the story is twofold. One is that, um, uh, what happened next actually was an interesting piece of work done by one of his other PhD students named Brad Miller, who said, uh, it turns out that the implicit behaviors, you know, so for example, how much time you actually spent on reading the Usenet News article uh, was correlated with uh, essentially their explicit rating of their interest in that particular article. Now, at that point, I told uh, John, it's like, this is also going all wrong because users' implicit behavior may not necessarily match with their taste. In other words, how much time they spent is not necessarily how satisfied they are. Um, and another reason I said, John, your idea is stupid and uh, you know, I'm not going to work on this. And in 1994, they published one of the most well-cited CSCW papers of all times on collaborative filtering. And that paper and the subsequent system eventually won the ACM Software System Award. That was the second part of the story. And so um, in a way, I never worked on recommender systems until I came to Google. And so in a way, this is a story about why you should never follow my advice, because it turns out that uh, I made some very terrible choices early in my career. Um, but it is also an interesting a story in terms of uh, uh, Martin's question here, which is what role should users have in the in their participation in the design of a, of a recommender system, for example? Is it that they uh, give input implicitly through their behavior? Is it that they should give explicit uh, ratings? It turns out right at the formation, even before the first paper was published in the area, I have fundamental misgivings about some of these challenges. And uh, even and now, nearly 30 years later, uh, we're still struggling with the same questions. So um, I, I guess, you know, with apologies to my, to, to my now deceased uh, PhD advisor, uh, I guess I was at least half right. <laughs> hey, let me pick up on a couple of the threads that were said already, this may seem a little bit of a distraction, but just tell a little story too, which is when you when you see anyone sit down at Google Earth for the first time or Google Maps, I guess these things have been around for a while. I'm old enough to see people see it for the first time. It's always telling what they first look at. Like you have like the ability to look at the earth from anywhere. Like the first thing people look at is like their own house. Like <laughs> people are endlessly fascinated by themselves. And so one of the things that I think is a little bit underexploited is that when we ask people for feedback or inputs, it, it always strikes me as psychologically kind of astute because people also like talking, but, but doesn't fully capture this intense interest people have in self. So like, you know, what, what, what do we all do? Like when we're in an elevator, we're like, look in the mirror, like we're like super, or we even on these calls, like you could look at anyone else, but you're like, find yourself looking at yourself. Why you see yourself all the time. But, so I've often wondered if there's a way we, instead of asking for feedback, say in the recommender system example, we could show the user what we understand them to be, kind of like create a mirror. Like, this is what we understand you to be. This is what we understand your preferences to be. So that there's something to react to and there may be surprises to the user. Like, oh, I have been watching a lot of Korean drama pieces, like, yeah, you know, like, or whatever. Like, you know, I, I didn't even think about this, but that, 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 that is me. And now I can, it has that reflexive 
piece beyond just giving us objectives. It allows the user to introspect a little bit. It's got intrinsic value, but I've wondered if that's a way or if anyone's seen something like that where there's a way for us to kind of play back either your own data to yourself as a way of getting objectives or perhaps the system. If this is the system that we're designing. Is this the kind of system you want to be a part of or you know, whatever that looks like, I think that would be interesting. I mean, I guess I'll, if we're, if we're going on with discussing, like I, I really agree with the, the last point you were making, um, but I also just kind of, uh, in light of the topic uh, of this whole event, um, I do want to sort of caution or flag that uh, some people love talking and some people don't love talking. Right. Some people will look at themselves in the thing, uh, in the video, and some people won't, right? Yeah. So it is the case that, uh, right. you know, people think about themselves, but it's also thinking about themselves in context, which is a broader thing. Um, and it is the case that people like to look at themselves or people like to reflect on themselves in some way, but it's also the case that some people hate looking at themselves, yeah. <laughs> talking, right? And so like in the spirit of sort of participation uh, and speaking across, uh, you know, different, uh, different mindsets, I think it is really important to realize that like a, a you focused thing might be very useful for some people, but for some people it might really kind of uh, turn them off. So just th think that's useful to, to flag, um, but it's a really good point about like how to doing a mirror reflection sort of in order to get participation. Building on what you're saying, it's, it's apps. I never watch my talks. I cannot stand the idea of seeing myself. So it's, it's true. Like there is this aversion. We also <laughs> interrupted a little time. Go ahead. Oh, I'll jump in by uh, maybe invoking some of my uh, interest in the in the past in HCI, since this uh, uh, very much about the user here. Um, and there's two things I'm thinking about when Sanhel and and Meg is talking about uh, reflections or mirrors of ourselves. Uh, the first one, of course, is that this connects all the way back to um, early days of Greek mythology and 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 philosophy of Nar narcissists and, mm -hmm. and uh, Aphrodite and, and, and whatnots, right? But the other interesting connection uh, to philosophy or to so uh, sociolo uh, sociology in general, of course, is also the work of Erwin Goffman uh, on the presentation of everyday self. And here, what's interesting about that and how it connects to perhaps the, the story that I mentioned earlier of the difference between what is it that we think we do versus what is it that we do? Um, and it connects to this concept of presentation of everyday self because what Erwin Goffman basically said was um, that uh, uh, we have an ideal, essentially we kind of in a way have um, some idealized version of, of views of ourselves. Um, and then there's kind of ourselves kind of existing within the social environment and we uh, choose to expose different facets uh, to other people, kind of like on a stage when we're interacting with others. And so interestingly in recommender systems that are social versus not social. So mm -hmm. for example, whether your actions are being observed by other or not, um, people actually do behave differently, right? Like, you know, uh, whether you thumb up something, if it's visible to others, uh, versus not actually is in a way predicted by uh, the, if you want to think about it, you know, maybe connecting to things that Sand Hill knows much more about than I do on game theory, for example, right? You're, you're, you're thinking about how you're going to present to others is going to be drastically different, whether your behavior is visible to others or even to yourself. I think that's where I'm kind of taking it this, uh, this mm -hmm. a little bit. Sandhill was kind of talking about just, can we give you some reflections of yourself, which is about the differences between your vision of your idealized self and, and who, what you actually do. And then there's the social aspect, which is what is the idealized version of yourself that you believe you should present mm -hmm. and what you actually present, which is Erwin Goffman's point, as I understand it. The conference calls and these sort of online things offer a really remarkable opportunity for like this activity, don't they? It's like suddenly it would seem to me from an organizational behavior point of view, there's this collective and individual behavior. And I, has anyone seen, I mean, even 
uh, would, imagine there's just a tracker at the bottom that said, what fraction of the time have you talked? Is that like, it, it seems like there's a lot we could do in this space around this that would be, and it could just be private, only you see it and you can enable it or not enable it or, you know, it's really, a, but, but have, have people seen attempts to do this? Because suddenly, you know, our actual lives are digital in a way that they hadn't been two years ago. It is interesting. I feel like I have, there are definitely things that I've seen at, at various companies and organizations in the past that have done things. One thing that I remember noticing with a very old version of this um, is that people reacted in different ways. Um, that, uh, for example, you some people might think, oh, if someone is shown talking a whole lot, they'll think to dial back. Other people are like, oh, good, I talked a whole lot. Um, and it, it's, it's very interesting. It makes you realize just how different everyone's um, viewpoints on these things are. Um, one of the things that I think is really interesting that is, is coming up here is this idea of this is all a very, um, there's feedback loops. It's a dynamical system in the sense that even as we provide feedback, whether it's you know liking something or the, the social aspect, it then it's it's there are these consequences and it's not just a very simple function that we're looking at we're looking at the function in con in context and i think this relates to um something margaret was talking about of foresight being important and how can we have foresight with such complicated systems are there um sort of ways that people are designing systems can think to look ahead um, is the most we can hope for very rapid hindsight should we think about monitoring instead um, I'm curious to open this up to discussion um I actually think what I'm gonna say Martin you probably know a lot more about so uh, correct me if I'm wrong but one really fascinating thing I learned about coming to Google was this idea of user journeys uh, and critical user journeys, um, where the idea is you think about different kinds of specific people who could be using your product um, or working with the system in some way, and what their full flow of interactions would be, uh, what they'd be interested in and what they wouldn't be interested in, and then how things would evolve with them. So it really helps to ground on specific individuals. Uh, I mean, we as we develop, we think about like generalities, like maybe we'll say like, this is this way for men, this way for women. Um, but as soon as you start grounding on specific individuals, you can learn a lot more and understand a lot more about long-term effects specifically for this person. Um, and so like there's this critical user uh, journey idea. And then there's also based on the sort of critical users that you have developed, you can also then speak to uh, people who roughly correspond to that to really understand specifically like what their experience would be, what they would be and what how they would use the system, uh, what they would end up doing. Um, and so, for example, I worked on a project where we had a lot of critical user journeys for engineers. We like mapped out our basic theory about how this all works and uh, how, like the kinds of things they would need uh, to strengthen the work they were doing. Um, and then we had interviews with engineers <laughs> and just sort of talked through, you know, we found people who kind of roughly corresponded to the engineers and developers who we thought might be using this. And then just, you know, sat and had in interviews with them to better understand like, how is this going to affect your work? Um, and so it was, it's really, I mean, the point I'm making is that in order to have foresight, a very useful thing is to ground your thinking in individuals. Building a little bit on that, I think once we sort of grounded in the individual, build on something I mentioned around game theory, I think, I, you know, we should never fool ourselves into thinking we're going to have foresight. Like, I think rapid hindsight is really, really important no matter what. But one of the things that can help us a little bit is, I think game theory has is, is become this sort of highly mathematized field for no particular reason. Like, the, the big ahas in game theory were actually quite beautiful because what they were was they gave us a taxonomy of social interactions that was useful. Oh, like this type of situation looks like a prisoner's dilemma. This type of situation looks like a tragedy of the commons. This type of situation looks like coordination game of multiple equilibrium. Like there are these paradigmatic kind of social interaction structures that we have 
And I think at that level, game theory could be incredibly helpful because once we've done what you're saying, Meg, and like gotten the individual perspective, now say, well, if those are the individual perspectives, does this look like a tragedy of the commons? Does this look like a race to the bottom? Does this look like a signaling game? Like, and we can apply those and, and you know, it's not always gonna work. We're gonna have errors, but we can be like, oh, if this is a signaling game, we know how those turn out. Like everyone's gonna like race to have the biggest car or the biggest house or, you know, even if that. And so I think having some of those, I guess, you know, stereotypical games in mind, doing the, the ground up as Meg is saying, and then trying to slot them in and say, do any of these look like they might resolve given the way I've designed the system. And so then maybe I should be moving it from a signaling game to something that looks more like a, you know, I think that could be kind of um, interesting. And I'll jump in by, um, I think Sandhill and I should have coordinated better. Uh, he, should, he should provide a more positive view uh, before I say my bit here. Um, which is that, uh, you know, obviously in the 10 minute that I got in the, in the lightning talk, I, I spoke about wicked problems. And, and the nature of wicked problems that is so dynamical or that the social uh, understanding of it or our ability to apply foresight to predict how the problem will shift over time is actually very problematic. Uh, that's literally within the definition of wicked problems. And I think, I think Sandhill has a lot of uh, 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 authority to speak to some of the interesting examples, challenges that we have found in these spaces. So for example, his work on cigarette taxes or, um, or how the, the nature of corruption, how it works on, on, on obtaining driver licenses uh, in India and whatnot, right? There are these very surprising uh, results that come from it. And I think that's where it connects to Sandhill's point here about behavioral economics, which is that you know, what we're hoping to do there, obviously, is using mathematical models to actually understand behavior uh, and to understand the incentive mechanism and to understand the mechanism design. And, you know, essentially, uh, these taxonomies of situations, as Sandhill was, was mentioning uh, about it, uh, you know, part of the work is it's finding holes in these theories. When these game theories or mechanisms uh, don't work the way that we expect them to. And uh, the beauty of what we're seeing is in, in a way, if you consider that to be beauty, in the sense of intellectually interesting beauty, not in the sense of that our mathematical theory or behavioral economic theories are broken, uh, is that we find these very surprising examples. So it's not just that we have these taxonomies of situations, but we also have a catalog of things that where they don't work. And we're like, why doesn't it work? <laughs> why is it not incentive aligned? You know, why is it not incentive uh, compatible? And, and the be the wicked problems. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I was I was just saying like this is this frustrating moment of but I have this beautiful theory and it all works together. So <laughs> that's right. That's right. And and um, I experience a lot of that um, as you can imagine in working on notification system, classification systems, and, and, and recommender systems, because, you know, in a way, the product designers and the, and the executives are trying to write down physical laws of how these systems should work. And then we find surprising, oh, by the way, users don't want it that way. Oh, that's surprising. That doesn't <laughs> match with my mental model of how, how they want the world to be. Now they change something. And then, oh, look at this. It's no, no longer incentively uh, aligned either. So. I think that the point that you're making here is, I think, so central. It's probably where we should have started, as you said, Ed, which is at some deep level, there's a, an immense amount of humility you need in all of these systems, because it's not even at the level of, oh, it goes to scale and then it surprises you. It can go to scale, enter an equilibrium, things look one way, and then it surprises you years later. Because you know, my favorite example of this is, it's, it's amazing how well, how poorly this example works. And it's a testament to human memory. All of us in 2012 had a very different view of social media. It was Arab Spring. It was the power of social media to unlock individual voices, unheard voices, democracy blooming. It's, we, no, no one believes this, but we all thought this. 
Like we were 100% convinced the story of social media is the story of helping downtrodden masses rise up. Right? I mean, even at that point, there was even at that point, some of the early stuff around citizen journalism, like, look, everyone will be able to take videos and expose corrupt. I mean, it was a pretty, so we knew, we thought we understood where that system equilibrated. And it, you know, that was a surprise then too. None of us anticipated Arab Spring. And then suddenly, like, look where the system equilibrated three, two, three years later. So it's kind of continued wickedness of the problem in these dynamical systems is something we just have to be super humble about, I think. Yeah, I think that it's really good to keep that in mind, for sure. I, it's funny, it's like, you know, I think there is this tension as we look for um, things that a designer can do. Um, but also, I, it's, you're right, probably the absolute most important thing is to just realize the limits of, of our knowledge. And I think this is why, you know, being very observational about what's actually happening is important. Um, it is interesting, you know, as you were talking before, I was thinking about combining something, you know, Margaret was saying about critical user journeys and the kind of game theoretical perspective. It's like, should we be thinking about critical group journeys, critical user games, you know, oh. maybe there are these oh, right, yeah. templates that we can start thinking that go beyond the individual, um, for sure. Um, I'm curious, uh, you know, one thing, it, Maybe this is, is getting back to something a little too specific, but one thing I really liked in, in the, the lightning talks were some of the ex very good examples of things we should be thinking about. So this question about weighting false positives versus false negatives just comes up all the time. And I've, I've seen many situations where people just weight them equally without even thinking that they should make that decision. Um, and I think this question about, say, label leakage, uh, Sandil, that you made up, I, you talked about that's also really important. Do you, any of you have other examples you've seen of cases where, uh, you know, either objective functions went wrong or were ignored in some way that uh, you feel like okay, that's something people should be aware of? Are there other? I don't want to get greedy for good examples, but um, I'd love to hear any if any come to mind. Well, one thing that might be kind of funny or fun to share is I was working on a dialogue system. Um, and we were trying to uh, use these deep learning methods to see if we could capture uh, multiple interactions. Could we track state across multiple interactions uh, and then have the system respond in, in a well-informed way in light of the conversation? Um, but we were using, you know, like maximum likelihood estimation. So let, what is the most common, what is the easiest thing to say? Or what is the, yeah, what is the most common thing to say? Uh, and the system would just end up uh, ending the conversation by saying, I don't know, I'm just me. <laughs> like over and over again. It just somehow picks this up that you can always say that <laughs> in a conversation and then you can end it. <laughs> um, and so we actually had to think of another kind of objective or like how do we fit this in to actually diversify? And this is actually a problem that's come up again and again, like this difference between getting the majority and then diversifying in some way so that it's not always the kind of same thing. Uh, I had another experience similarly with vision to language systems uh, where we were learning from how people describe sequences of events and trying to get descriptive stories from there. And we ended up at first with a system that would go like picture by picture and just go, this is awesome. This is awesome. Everything was awesome. It was awesome. Somehow learned that like people when they're talking about pictures often say, and it was awesome, or this was an awesome time. So it was just like, everything is, we called it the everything is awesome machine. <laughs> so like, it's fun as a reflection of ourselves. Like we apparently tend to say awesome when we're talking about um, describing a bunch of images to tell a story. Um, uh, but it's also not exactly what we want if we're trying to make a system that that sounds intelligent. So it's sort of interesting mismatch. So you so you built a teenager and, a, and an eight year old. That's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to up there. <laughs> I, I have an example from work uh, we did uh, last year where it was it, it was um, it's actually an algorithm at scale. This was a healthcare algorithm. Um, and that example I always go back to because it's it, it's it takes us to where you started us off, Martin. It's around objective functions as well. So there the story was, here this was an algorithm to find patients in need of care. And there, the, the interesting part of the story is six different teams had built this algorithm. So there are six different versions of the algorithm and they all had the same problem. So it, 
and, 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 but yet it was at scale already. And what they did was they said, oh, let's find using our data, the patients in greatest need for, for, for care. Um, and so then they built it, predicted it. And then what we found was this huge racial bias. So condition on the algorithms ranking of how much care you need, you find black patients are much sicker. So to end up at the same ranking by the algorithm, you would have had, there's these thresholds for who gets into these programs. You would have doubled the number of blacks if you had cut by health rather than by the algorithm ranking. So huge gap. So where does it come from? And I think it comes from something, it's actually revealing about something important, which is in healthcare, we often talk about how, how sick someone is. But when that instantiates into the data, sometimes what we mean is physiological measures like blood pressure. Sometimes what we mean is, oh, how much care did you use? Those look similar, but actually one is, and they are for most purposes, but from the purpose of an algorithm, if you said find people who end up using a lot of care, well, for the same level of health, blacks have less access, so they end up using less care. So if you predict care usage, you end up with bias with respect to physiological health. If you predict physiological health, you get to the more the right outcome. But there is this kind of miscommunication that's very subtle. It, it, it's not, you know, because the teams were very diverse, all six, some were nonprofit, some were for profit. It's clear it has something to do with an ill developed language for communication of these fairly specific objects that are quite brittle. That is, there are tons of research, research papers that talked about healthcare, utilization costs, you know, everyone, we kind of understood. And when we as humans work with these, we know there's a little bit of a difference and we adjust on the fly and we take care of it. But we have to be very literal when talking, you know, when putting it into a data frame and having an algorithm optimize against it. And something gets lost in that literalness. And we've seen quite a few examples, like that's probably the starkest, but quite a few examples of that variety where some literality is dropped, is in, infused into the system. And I'll um, maybe uh, jo jump in uh, and thinking about this this false positive question in a in a framing that connects again to my earlier point on wicked problems. Um, it, the when we think about false positive rates or or in psychology, a lot of times they talk about type one, type two error. Which I always get confused which one is type one and type two. And then a little while ago, I, I decided to I'm just going to keep repeating the whole day. The type one is false positive. Type one is false, and then I finally got it. You know, for the, I hope for the rest of my life I won't forget that. Um, but uh, the reason why I'm, I'm I'm bringing that up is really because false positive rates and and these cost functions are indeed actually pretty counterintuitive a lot of times to people. And um, what's make them even more wicked, uh, in, not in the sense of evil, but in the sense of of difficult. Um, it's also that it's really difficult for us to predict the feedback loop effects of in, uh, how individual decisions uh, kind of compound on each other. Uh, this is also another reason why um, poverty, for example, uh, is really hard to eradicate is because it's really hard to get people to think about compounding interests, um, both on the positive and the negative side. How do they get themselves out of uh, terrible feedback loops? So I think I want I, I would like to broaden Martin's questions a little bit here to sort of not just thinking about individual decisions that we're making. And this is a point again, you know, connecting to the game theoretical uh, components of 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 and, and mechanical uh, mechanism design is that it's not a single term uh, decisions that we worry about. It's loops of decisions that we worry about, and loops of false positive. Uh, decisions, uh, issues that we run into. And so view from that perspective, I think what's even more damning about some of the challenges that we face, you know, going back to Meg's uh, 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 presentation or lightning talk about uh, uh, value laden decisions. And if you don't make decisions, what's your role in that feedback loop? How what are we doing about the fact that technology is essentially a kind of amplifier, whether on the positive or the negative side? Social media, for example, you know, is maybe an amplifier for good in the case of Eris Spring, but an amplifier for bad when 
um, they're used to uh, disseminate uh, disinformation, for example. And so my main concern is really that feedback loop, um, the second derivative, the, the first or second derivative, if you will. Great. Yeah. So we are approaching the end. Um, and I would like to give you each like a chance to sort of, if there's any um, advice or call to action you would like to give uh, to li listeners, um, you know, I think there's both a very interesting opportunity here. I think there's important ways that we can work together. But one thing that is coming up, and I'm seeing this actually on questions, both on comments on Twitter and on um, our question and answer system, uh, that there are also these big issues around translation people talking about different things. And this has come up here, of course. Um, and who gets to talk about uh, gets to talk about these these boundary objects. So I'm curious if, um, you know, just as give you a, a, a last chance before we close, just to say any last words of advice for people uh, who are thinking about these systems or working on them. Just because someone sounds really smart and confident doesn't mean that they're smarter than you. <laughs> 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 Don't give away the game, Meg. We have a yeah. <laughs> That's great advice. So I'll, I'll go with one, which is uh, I'll start with a confession. Uh, I had to look up what a boundary object was. And I'm starting with that confession because I think it, it, it's, it's, real, it's a real treat to learn stuff. And it really is very, very valuable. Like I'll never understand boundary objects as well as you all do, but having learned a little bit of it helps me just be a little bit more bilingual. And I think my, my advice would just be like, it's actually super fun to learn and building on the last thing. It's, it's, it's learning a little bit. It's like learning a little bit of a language. And I would encourage you all to just like dabble and sample and learn from, because this is a time when we're going to need a lot more bilingualism. So. Well, um, you know, this is a, it's interesting times uh, this year, right? And uh, um, I had a, everyone has had a, a rather difficult year. Um, I, I'm in a particularly reflective mood, uh, usually this time of the year. First of all, it's because, partially because my birthday was very nearby. I think, I think someone else on the panel might also have a birthday, uh, if I'm not uh, mistaken, but I don't want to out the person. Um, <laughs> But why am I bringing that up? Uh, well, I think this year have been a wonderful, wonderful opportunity uh, to do some self-reflection, both as individuals and also as groups and as a society. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe perhaps as my, unfortunately, age only increases monotonically, right? So as the, the years pile on, um, I become even more self-reflective every year at the end of the year. And I've come to the realization that the most important thing that we can do as individuals and as groups is um, use these self-reflective times to help ourselves to become better versions of ourselves. And to solve some of these wicked problems, uh, whether we're using these boundary objects or not, we need to enlist the people around us to help us to become better versions of ourselves. And the systems that we build are simply reflections of our humanity. And so as a result, by creating better versions of ourselves, we'll create better systems. So, you know, I think Sandhill's point about learning here is important and poignant. Um, you know, if we are continuing to learn, then there's progress, but if we're not learning, then there's no progress in building better versions of ourselves and the systems that we're in. Terrific. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Um, I personally have really enjoyed this conversation. Um, it's just a treat to be able to uh, listen to um, three people like you talk about these issues. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for, for coming. Um, I think with that, we're gonna wrap up the panel. Um, uh, this is funny. I'm realizing there's normally a point where everyone applauds, and that's also something that is 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 missing. Um, but if you're at home listening, I hope you li uh, applaud. It's um, uh, virtually. Um, but the thing that I would like to say is that you can keep the conversation going. Um, and uh, let's see. I think there's even a slide that talks um, how we can do that next. Um,
So uh, there are, you know, there's social media hashtags you can use. Um, you know, please continue talking with us. Most immediately, for those of you who have signed up, there are breakout sessions where you can talk about these, uh, continue the conversation in small groups. Um, and so with that, I basically just want to thank our speakers again. Um, wish you happy conversation.